She most recently served as a consulting producer on the show Nashville. After 36 years, she has moved home to Oklahoma, and she has several projects in development at the moment, including the script for the movie for Blessed Stanley Rother. Uh, she's also working on a miniseries with Oprah Winfrey that starts, stars Octavia Spencer and a series starring Melina Ken. Thank you, Kendarides. She'll tell you more about that, I'm sure. Anyway, please welcome Nancy Mill. Okay. Archbishop, thank you for inviting me, and Peter, and Lisa. Where's Lisa? You've been great. Um, to share God's impact and influence, my crazy career in Hollywood, and the impact that he had on my career. Okay. Um, it was a great honor that you'd have faith in me, and I just hope it wasn't a big mistake. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable on the page than the stage, so bear with me. I promise I'll get through this, if I can turn the page. Okay, when I sit down to write a pilot, and a pilot is the first episode of any series, the first thing that I do is I figure out what it's going to be about, and then I create the characters. I don't really care about the resume, where he went to college, his grade point average, or his work history. To really get to know someone, I think this is in life as well as a character on TV, you have to know how they're gonna react in a situation. On TV, it's in a scene. And I come up, I have to answer questions like this. What is his biggest secret, the one that he's never told anybody? What is his lifelong dream? And the reason it's never, ever going to come true. What did he hear from his parents when they were fighting when he was six years old that made him fill a shoebox with everything he owned and run away from home? Now, there's a lot of others, other things, but the most important to me is what is the divining mo <laughs> what is the defining moment of his life? I believe that all of us have that moment. When our lives change, the moment that defines who we are or what we'll become. For me, that moment happened when I was a freshman in high school, in college, and my dad died. It just flattened me. I had never experienced that deep, dark hole of grief and the feeling that I could never, ever crawl out of it. I read so many books looking for comfort for something that would take my pain away, but I found nothing and I felt like I had no one to, to turn to that would understand. So I turned to pizza and beer and fraternity parties and those glorious days of a wishbone offense and a defensive line of Lucius, Leroy, and Dewey Selman. I was so mad at God, I never wanted to speak to him again. He was the one I should have turned to, but I was too mad, except to yell at him and to ask him why. Why did he take away my dad? But he had plans for me, born from that grief that began to shape, take shape when I started writing down my pain on the page. I spent hours writing of my sorrow, confusion, and memories of naturally the greatest father who ever lived in the history of the world. First, it was poetry, really bad poetry. <laughs> the kind, you know, that rhymes dad and sad, goodbye and cry, that kind of a literary masterpiece. Some of my friends read them and said that they were really good. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna to move to LA and sell these brilliant poetry as song lyrics. So I made it to LA with 300 bucks and a car that broke down every other week. I knew nobody in LA and I knew nothing about selling lyrics. Who cares, right? One day I walk into Capitol Records with all of my poems in this little green school folder and told the security guard I wanted to talk to someone about selling song lyrics. He said, okay, well, who do you have a meeting with? I said, nobody. He said, well, you can't go upstairs. I can't let you upstairs unless you have a meeting. So I walked outside. I remember I was standing across from the Brown Derby and I thought, well, okay, okay, I guess I can't sell song lyrics, maybe I can write television shows. 
I'd never even seen a script. But with hubris and the ignorance of youth, I just assumed that I could do it anyway. It was a lot harder than I thought. I got a job as a bartender, and many times I almost quit and planned on moving home. But God's plans were different than mine. There's no way I should ever, ever have sold a script, ever had a meeting, ever created my own series, four of them. But we all know how that happened. It was by the grace and blessings of God. He opened the right doors to the right people. Eventually, I had some meetings, but I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know the lingo. I didn't know what to say. And if you compare it to the nerves I have today, just times it by 2,000. I marvel at what God did to me. For this oaky gal who was clueless in the land of Hollywood. But I was determined, and I started out by doing something that I never, ever did in college. I studied. I read every book that I could find about script writing, and I wrote 10 spec scripts in one year. And I eventually met one writer, one writer who was working. He read one of my scripts, and he said that I was very raw, but that I should keep writing. That was all I needed. He gave me back my script in an envelope from his agent. In those days, you couldn't sell a script without an agent. You couldn't get an agent without selling a script. So what was I supposed to do? How about lie? <laughs> I took his envelope, steamed off the label of his re agency's return address, and I put it on the outside of my envelope. So the show that I sent it to thought it was from an agent. Inside was my script. I had just heard that they hired a new story editor. I didn't even know what that was. But I heard that they were the ones that read scripts. So I included a note to the story editor that had left and said, here is the script we talked about. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Nancy Miller is a fantastic writer. <laughs> so just as I planned, or how God planned, the new story editor read my script. I don't think God wanted me to tell a lie, but I think maybe the Holy Spirit is who gave me that idea. <laughs> About a month later, I get a call. It was the show, and they liked my script, and they wanted to hire me to write another script. That's how I sold my first script. I remember running down the beach, yelling and jumping, thanking God and promising him I would go to Mass every Sunday for the rest of my life. That lasted about two months. <laughs> so I went on stumbling my way into a career, thinking, thanking God when things went right, or panic with panic, prayer, panic with panic prayers of, please God, please God, let me sell this script. Because I didn't know any better, I decided I wanted my own show on the air. I had an agent by now. And she told me I was being ridiculous, that no one would even take a meeting with me. I sold two scripts. She didn't know God had these plans for me. Turn the page. So I made my own meeting with the only producer that I knew. He bought it. So I had sold my first pilot. Never made it to air, but I was in the club of writers that sold pilots. So I spent every day I could doing research for my next pilot. I went to countless crime scenes. I hung out in the cor coroner's office for three days, and I finally left crying for months at what I saw. I spent three days on an army base in, in Alabama, uh, researching the medics that were there. I wanted to know who they are and what they did. I left that place feeling like I had done nothing with my life. These were real life heroes who had saved countless lives in dangerous conditions that you can't even imagine. At one time I met a Secret Service agent at midnight at the White House. He took me on a tour of the first floor, including the Oval Office. It was very cool. Another time I went to a homicide convention. I learned absolutely nothing about how to solve a homicide, but I learned how cops blow off steam and have a good time. 
But back to that first script that I solved, the one where I lied. I found a way to mention God in that script, and I think in every script that I wrote afterwards. What I was doing, I realized much later, was in a way I was practicing my faith in those scripts. It wasn't the same as going to Mass, but I kept God alive in my heart and in my writing. At first, I felt like I had to do it under the radar, because Hollywood really wasn't the place to talk about God. <clears throat> it's better these days, but it's definitely not encouraged, especially in a script. So I'd start a scene with the family coming home from dinner, or coming home from Mass, and then Dad, who was a detective, because it's all we write on television, was called to go to a crime scene to solve a murder. I remember one weekend I was on call from the sheriff's department, and if someone died a questionable death, they would call me. I really wanted that phone to ring, but I didn't want anybody to die. So I was really, I didn't know what to wish, wish for. That call came in the middle of the night. I was excited to go to that crime scene. From that crime scene, without ever mentioning it, I found a way to have a scene take place in a Catholic church. In another script, one of my characters had a tattoo on his arm of the Blessed, Birth, of the Blessed Mother. I never made a big deal out of it, never mentioned it, but it was a vi visual statement instead. As I sold more scripts, I started to be on writing sets, and I got a little bit bolder. Somebody might actually mention God in my script or having to get to Mass. And then when I had my own series, the gloves were off. One of my characters would always, always be Catholic and even talk about their faith or leave a crime scene to get to Mass or even pray. In my first series, two of my characters were Catholic. One practiced their faith and the other one didn't. We were canceled after six episodes but God also had more plans for me. For my next series, which also lasted only six episodes, it was about the LA's coroner's office, about death, and how my characters lived life out loud, laughing and very spiritually. God was all over that series. One character wasn't afraid of dying. She had a line that said, why is everyone afraid of death? Life is just an intermission to get us ready for the real adventure. One of those main characters also was Catholic. My faith had nothing to do with my writing though. My next series was called Any Day Now, and it was about the secret friendship between a little black girl and a little white girl in 1963, Birmingham, Alabama. And that's where I went every summer of my life because both of my parents were from there. Again, one of the two leads, played by Annie Potts, was Catholic. She was a Catholic, she was a practicing Catholic, and her name in the series was Mary Elizabeth. When we saw little Mary Elizabeth as a little girl, just like my parents did, she went to Mass every single Sunday. No matter the weather, how tired they were, the fight that my parents just had to break up between me and my sisters, we always went to Mass. Same with Annie Potts' character when she was a little girl. The same when I went to Christ the King, where I went to grade school. We had to go to Mass twice a week, and I was bored out of my mind. Let me apologize before I go further. I'm sorry, Your Excellency. <laughs> me and my best friend were partners in crime. We were the ones in Mass scraping our shoes on the floor to make fart noises. We'd peek in the windows of the convent to see what the nuns did when they weren't teaching. They were so mysterious to us in those black robes and rosary beads flapping as they ran down the hall. And then we would perform a Catholic funeral for every dead animal that we could find. We had a graveyard on the side of my uh, house. We'd make communion wafers out of Wonder Bread. Grape juice was the wine and we put little crosses on all the graves. A lot of that found my way into the shows that I wrote. With little Renee, her character wasn't Catholic, but her family went to church and they were very, very religious. When they were little girls, Renee was played by uh, Lorraine Toussaint. 
And we saw them as little girls and also in the present when they had grown up. Little Renee invited Mary Elizabeth over, who had never been in a black person's house. Above the fireplace was a painting of a black Jesus. And in the dialogue of the, night, of the night, early 1960s, Mary Elizabeth said, how come you got a colored Jesus up there? Renee told her, because Jesus is colored. Mary Elizabeth said, no, he's not, he's white. They went back and forth a few times and then they went out to play. I created that series because I hoped any day now we would get past our past and embrace one another with trust and love. Then came Saving Grace. I'll just say, when I started that show, I had very dark, lovely hair. And now you can see what I look like. I said it right here in Oklahoma City, which I've been trying to do ever since I started writing. Holly Hunter was Grace, and she was one mess of a woman. She was Catholic, but had turned far, far away from her faith. Her brother was a priest and prayed every day that she would come back to the church. I was upset at that time of the scandals that walked, rocked our church and the sick crimes that were committed and all the lives that were ruined. And then the cover-up, which broke my heart and made me question my faith. But I was able to separate the criminal from my... with from the victim, from my faith, but I was still furious. So I wanted to write about that, but I also wanted to balance the evil with good. So I gave Grace a brother who was a wonderful priest. He had no idea that his little sister Grace had been molested by a priest when she was a child. It would have explained a lot about Grace, but no one knew. She had never told anybody but her best friend. Grace had an angel named Earl. And he wasn't anything like Della Reese and Touched by an Angel. <laughs> or Michael land landed in a Highway to Heaven. Earl was the kind of angel that I would want, that I would need. He chewed tobacco, he had a sense of humor, and endless patience with grace. No matter what she did, he was going to drag her, kicking and screaming, back to God. I think God that meets us where we are. Drunk in a ditch, in prison for murder, even those who molest children. And he certainly met Grace in that sad, angry, unforgiving place where she hated her faith, didn't believe in God, and had made up her mind that he was nothing but a cruel joke that was invented years ago, thousands of years ago. Because if there was a God, on April 19th, on this day, 23 years ago, at 9.02, he never would have created Timothy McVeigh and the others who murdered 168 innocent people. Grace was supposed to babysit her sister's newborn child on April 18th, but she was hungover. So Grace said, I'll babysit the next day, which was April 19th. So her sister went into the Murrow building to the Social Security office and never came out. Grace knew that she could never, ever forgive herself for that. But God had other plans. He never gave up on her. He will never give up on anybody, nobody in this room, who has a secret or an ugly episode where they were, you know, not very nice to a waiter, yelling at your child, or cheating on your spouse. He never gave up on me either. He steered me into a wonderful career. I never had a huge hit, and he knew better. He knew not to give me a big hit, because I could have turned into a real jerk. But he allowed me to tell the stories that I needed to tell. My second series was about death, which was my way of coming terms with my, to terms with my dad's death. Any day now, where I got to explore race from those summers that I spent in Birmingham, and then Saving Grace, where I got to explore God, faith, sin, and redemption. I literally felt his hand guiding my hand as I wrote that pilot. The characters came alive like I had never written before. They had a mind of their own, and they went places that I didn't know they would go. Back then, no network wanted to do any shows about death, 
race, or God. But lucky for me, God had other plans. That's it. Thank you. So are you going to do that? Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes for some questions if anybody would like to ask any. Kathy? Yes. Me too. I'm getting ready to go to LA. I'm, I'm going to try to sell this limited series about the first female pilots in World War II. It's fascinating what they went through. They were the test pilots because they didn't want the men to die. And 38 of them died. And when they died, the army wouldn't give them a funeral. So the women had to collect money, throw in their money, and have a furniture, have a furniture, have a funeral, and even buy the flag that went on their coffin. So it's, it's an amazing story. I'm sure everyone heard about that Southwest flight with the woman pilot. And she and all other women pilots are, are on a job because of these women that started, you know, that flew in World War II. So I'm doing that. Um, what else am I doing? This mini series, waiting for that to, to go. Lots of times, you know, you can have something in development for years. And then all of a sudden you get a phone call. It's, you know, can you be here tomorrow? So I don't know if that'll ever get made. Um, but I've come to realize if things don't get made, there's a reason for it. When I was working on Saving Grace, we were supposed to start shooting, you know, on whatever date. And then they called and they said, well, they go, you can't find a star. They wanted a star. And since we couldn't find one, they said, okay, we're going to roll it over to next year. That means you're not ever going to do it. So I got to come home for the last three months of my mom's life. Then they call me when I go back to LA and they said, we want to do this. So that was like, things happen. It's God's planning and time, not ours. So, and then the Father wrote for movie. You know, I, I pray that I get to write that script because, and I'm praying to him, you know, if, if now is the time and I'm the writer, Let's go. Let's get it done. You know? So those are the main things that I'm working on. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Why do you think Hollywood is so afraid of God? You know, they're afraid of just about everything <laughs> that, that um, isn't their belief system, especially Christianity. Um, I don't know if it's because they don't believe or they're just like, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to offend people. It's like, well, I think more people in our country probably believe in God than don't. So I'm not sure there's other things that are taboo, kind of these unwritten rules that you would never, never talked about, but you know you didn't do. So I'm not sure, when, when I got to be friends with people, just about every one of them believed in God. But it was kind of like, it was a secret that you didn't talk about, so. Well, thank you for trying to work him in to your scripts and yeah. be kind of secret about it. Yeah, at the beginning, at the beginning. Yeah. And then I, wa I was watching some episodes of Saving Grace and it's like, I can't believe they let me do that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, you know, how much the Catholic Church was in that, and, and Retta's best friend was Catholic, I mean, or Grace's best friend was Catholic, so I guess I made up for all those times I couldn't, you know? Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.